Good afternoon, everybody. Thank you for coming today. Uh, I'm very, very excited about our speaker. Uh, I'll let our graduate student, Walter, Slola, introduce her. But I wanted to thank you all for coming. Um, I know we're in the middle of the semester, and I know it's a lot of tiredness and exams happening, but it's great that we're able to show up. Uh, and I also wanted to give a heads up that unlike the usual rhythm to the uh, speaker series, we will have a second speaker in March on the 21st on Tuesday. That email will be sent out. It's Ezra Zuckerman. Um, so we have a really exciting March. And so without further ado, I will turn the floor over to Coulter. Good morning, everyone. It's great to see you all today. Uh, today, I have the pleasure of introducing to you our distinguished speaker, Dr. Erica Summers Eckler, Professor of Sociology at the University of Notre Dame. As a remarkable social theorist, Dr. Summers Eckler's work lies at the intersection of sociology of culture, emotions, social movements, cognitive brain science, and interaction, while focusing on processes of persistence and social change. She's the author of 19 articles and book chapters, having landed in sociological theory, theory and society, advances in group processes, the handbook of sociology of emotions, and the philosophy of social sciences, among others. From these works, she developed a theoretical foundation for her first book, Laughing Saints and Righteous Heroes, Emotional Rhythms in Social Movement Groups, published by University of Chicago, uh, University of Chicago Press. She got this exceptional contribution to the social sciences she undertook three years of grueling ethnographic fieldwork with two separate groups, an anti-death penalty group and Catholic worker community to reveal how emotional processes contribute to the development, evolution, deterioration, and disintegration of social organization and social movements. That is, how micro-level dynamics influence the more macro-level processes. While her work frequently pushes the boundaries of standard sociological methodologies, she consistently develops ingenious techniques to understand the social processes which she seeks to investigate. Her recent work, which is, her, recent, her recent research focus, which is the focus of her talk today, has shifted to marine life, examining what different types of activities related to human-animal interactions reveal about self and emotions. So, Without further ado, please help me in welcoming Dr. Erica Summers Eckler. Thank you. That was a very nice introduction. I very much appreciate that. And I appreciate you having me out. I am it's my second time in Vancouver and I just can't believe you all get to live here. It's unbelievable. Um, and I'm uh, very glad to be on time. I'm not sure if any of you remember about 10 years ago, I came here to give a talk and I um, had the wrong passport. So embarrassingly, it was like three days late. Um, so I'm really happy to be on time today. Um, and I'm afraid that, uh, you know, it, you, I've already, it's already become clear that I'm doing a bait and switch. I'm presenting on something other than what, what I was advertised. And the idea was that I wanted to share work with you um, that is almost done so that you can be very helpful in terms of giving me feedback, but work that's more empirical uh, rather than the talk I was planning on giving, which was um, pretty much just pure theory. And that's, that's a little bit hard to um, present in a dynamic way, and it's also very difficult to discuss. Um, so bait and switch, you're getting whales. All right, so instead of like the whale breaching, that just seems so cliche. <laughs> The whale looking at you. All right. So um, today I'm going to talk about awe, fascination, and the making of marine biologists and naturalist guides. This work is done with Joey O'Donnell, who is uh, a, he was an undergraduate student of mine, and despite like my most intense and fervent pleas that he become a, a sociologist, he's starting medical school in the fall. So, um, but he he is he is key. He did many of uh, the interviews that you're going to see um, snippets of. So it, it's, I want to make sure that he gets his full due. So Joy O'Donnell, exceptional, maybe we can still get him an MD, PhD. Mm -hmm. Okay. So um, the planet isn't for human beings. We are just part of a bigger network on this planet. I've always seen myself as wanting to actually collect data, of course, as a scientist. 
but also advocate for those organisms on the uh, in your environment that can't advocate for themselves. So the danger of this topic is that it may seem some of the things may seem self evident, right? Um, this is something that probably everybody's sympathetic towards this sort of perspective. It's sort of commonsensical. Um, and we can take it for granted, but um, here's an example of another perspective that a naturalist uh, uh, gives this example of a, um, a person who was responding to him during a whale watch. I said something about southern residents that they're on their way to extinction if we don't change our behavior. She said something to the effect of, why should I care? I tried to connect everything to a much bigger picture than what she was imagining. and if, and, it, and the, the picture that was, uh, excuse me, at the end, I got her, but I think, oh, it's about you. I, I, the impact had to bring her, I had to bring it back to her. Okay, so like I said, the first is commonsensical, but the second is, is probably actually more common, right? So the question is, how do you get people from average, citizen to somebody who is willing to dedicate their life to um, studying and educating about another species. Now, my, I come to this with an interest um, in social change and emotions. Um, you know, my work historically has been about social movements, but I felt that there's quite a bit on emotion and social movements at this point, and not that there isn't more to do, but I became interested in people who get involved in change efforts that are much longer, longer than beyond their lifetime. And so I became interested in researchers and educators and um, what, to, what attracts them and what sustains them. So what we found in doing this work in terms of what attracts them and what sustains them is two emotion-driven processes. First, an initial motivating experience of awe and we found that this experience of awe sort of decentered the person. And I'll explain what decentering means um, in, just, in just a moment. Second, experience is a fascination that maintained the decentered perspective. Now, this talk is based on qualitative research using an abductive approach, which means we move back and forth between theory, uh, seeking out examples of what works, and inductively identifying patterns. Um, this is an example of positive sociology, sociology of what works. We purposely went and uh, you could uh, accuse us of sampling an independent variable, right? That we went to see um, what captures these people and what keeps them. So, um, and then we did ethnographic work. Uh, we did ethnographic work with um, Sea World and an ethnographic work with whale watching. And that ethnographic work is both, there, it includes both autoethnography, people accounting for their experiences, as well as um, you know, observations. And then we also talked um, to people who were researchers and naturalists about how they became and what motivated them to stay um, in these professions. So, and there are, I'm going to cover three points in this talk. First, how the self works and how it can become decentered. Second, how awe inspires involvement in long term change efforts. And third, how fascination maintains long term commitments to research and education. So, selfing and decentering. Now, I don't know. Uh, how many of you are knee deep in the micro sociological world, but there's a there's very little agreement in it, but the one thing that they do share in common is that the self is better understood as a process rather than a thing. So theorizing the self as, as an active process gives us theoretical leverage to understand this, how the self can be narrower or broader how it can be centered more closely um, to our physical body or how it can extend into the into our context. So. Now, elsewhere, I've argued that the self is shaped by two motivations. We sense or explore our world emotionally, and then we draw on these emotions to mark significant symbols. We draw on these significant symbols to both tacitly and actively manage our understanding of our context. 
This is to say so that first we engage in a sensing emotional process that seeks fresh emotional energy and second we engage in a contextualizing or cognitive process that helps us to anticipate through reconciling new information with old information. So we have two different motivations um, and they tend to cycle one into the next. So predictions based on history create a sense of personal history, right? This, it creates a center to this process. It's a line that we can follow through time. And when individuals are at the center of the world, personal experience marks the limits of this process. Bodily needs and constraints help to tie the center to the body, but we also all, for the most part, experience expansion of these processes to include other people that we love and care for. So our question about how we become inspired and committed to working for other species can be framed as a question about how the self can expand and into an entirely foreign aspect of our context. We can think of this sort of expansion as a decentering of the self. Now, this decentering of the self is not something that uh, sociologists or even psychologists have talked a lot about, but philosophers and theologians have developed lots of theories about decentered selves and what they're like. Their work has argued that religious and nature-based experiences offer an intensity necessary for shifting people's perceptions of themselves, their communities, and the world around them. So our work has found that when we dislodge the self from the center of our experience, should we, dis do we dislodge the sense of the being attached to a particular history around our body and uh, our personal experience, when, when we decenter that, things are from a, we can include aspects of our world and ourself that are not even in any way immediately linked back to us. So we don't have to be like the second quote that I gave you about the person want, why does it matter? And it had to be about her before she could care, right? So in more recent language, psychologists have referred to these moments of, descent, of being decentered as awe. Psychologists have found that awe-inspiring experiences are associated with selfless behavior, which they call elevation, and in, an increased sense of responsibility for aspects beyond the person themselves. And psychologists have identified two processes associated with awe. One is the sense of overwhelm. It, it generates a sense of being small in a large universe. The second is the need to accommodate a new perspective. So the current understanding of accommodation um, does not indicate how or why this information is accommodated. Understanding what triggers accommodations is essential for understanding the power of awe because not everyone who went whale watching was deeply moved. Some were and some weren't. This is to say that which triggers the need for accommodation is apparently not self-evident. In this work, we specify disorientation as a critical factor in generating law. Simply put, we argue that disorientation triggers overwhelm. We define disorientation as the experience of failing frames that momentarily stun us. And when they stun us, they require fresh calibrations to the world. We're going to, um, we're referring to Joey. Um, I'm going to, um, uh, discuss how the stunning has emotional, cognitive, somatic, and temporal aspects. So more routinely, we filter new experience through old frames. We easily reconcile the new with the old and thus maintain a thread of continuity across experiences. So in other words, we can rely on familiar tropes, habitual orientations, um, as ways of reconciling new information with old so that our world stays constant despite fluctuating context. So when old filters for managing information no longer work, we become disoriented. This is fairly self-evident. The thread of continuity between our history of experiences and our emerging uh, engagement, it breaks. And this leaves us untethered to our history and so we need to reorient. I couldn't breathe. It felt, my, it felt like my lungs had just completely ceased to exist. And my heart was in my throat, and I had tears streaming down my cheeks, 
and I was just covered in goosebumps. It was the intense, it, it was this intense feeling of nothing else in the world existing except for me and this humpback whale, this humpback whale, because it was my first experience, it was as if the whole world had shifted on its axis. Now looking at this quote, we begin to imagine how process-based sociological perspective can contribute to understanding how awe shapes pro-social perspectives in action. We capture these dynamics by briefly comparing whale watching and sea world shows. Now this distinction um, may seem quite obvious, right? Then, but what we're doing is we are focusing on how these experiences unfold differently. We're issuing the notion that authenticity accounts for the differences. And right now, in terms of looking at uh, SeaWorld in particular, but um, animals in, uh, uh, in uh, uh, reserves, the, the focus is on how authentic the experience is, and that this is assumed to, re, uh, to be related to how powerful the experience with the animal is. We suggest that authenticity is not a useful explanation. So I'll give you the upshot before I begin the comparison. So in the wild, we must extensively and actively reorient towards whales, and we experience a more pervasive and durable sense of awe at SeaWorld, we experience whales as moments of distraction and entertainment. So I begin with noting how actively one must deploy attention in these two settings. SeaWorld pairs surprise and tricks with sensory stimulation, and there is very little need to accommodate at SeaWorld. There's a field note. The breaching of the first whale accompanied by loud energetic music gets the crowd revved up. Not only did one not have to actively scan the waters at SeaWorld, one did not even have to turn their head to see the action. So in a naturalist compare, uh, comments on how and why this easy attention generates less perceptual challenge at SeaWorld. I think that when you see something in a cage or in a tank, it's still very much we are in our element. We are in control as opposed to when you have an encounter out in the wild, you're in their world. And I think that aspect has, is really lost. That lack of control, that sense that you're very, very, that's humbling. Part where, where you're like, wow, I'm just a tiny speck in this big world. So as the quote points out, we, we can indeed turn to whale watching in the wild to see more active demands on attention. So here's an example uh, compared to not needing to turn one's head. Whale, portside, the rush of passengers to port causes the boat to list in that direction, but not enough to make anyone worry. Choruses of, there it is, I saw it. That is so cool when the whale spouts water from its blowhole. Such jubilation. I am so excited. This is really happening. I'm out in the Atlantic Ocean looking at whales surfacing and diving. What an adrenaline rush. Now we spot the whale on the starboard side and, and it's even closer. Awesome. Heavenly. I'm so glad I am here. So beyond actively uh, deploying one's attention, we found that whale watching provided opportunities for far more disorientation. Now these quotes suggest one path to disorientation is finding an unanticipated connection in the unfamiliar. But it is for me, it's not size, although it's pretty cool. It's just their ability and their capacity to do what they do in what for us would be an incredibly hostile environment. Again, I think it's not only the size, it's the fact that the size is a creature that's closer to us. I mean, they're mammals. So that breath, exhalation really, is what you always gets people. When a whale surfaces, you see its eyes and you see it breathe. Yes, it's a connection. You don't realize that if something breathes, it's way closer. So opportunities to look each other in the eye, part of the reason why I chose the first picture, were the most frequent um, accounts of intense connections to whales. 
I believe when I looked eye to eye with a whale, there was a connection. There was a, they were looking into my soul and I was looking into their soul. And I have learned since of how incredibly smart they are, probably smarter than us, if we're gonna be honest. Now this unanticipated connection can lead to experiences that are fresh, intense, memorable, emotionally affecting. These are the moments when interviews, interviewees suggested that the um, change in perspective lasted far into the future. So these are the sorts of accounts people gave when we said, why did you become a marine biologist or a naturalist? So we have identified four uh, dimensions of overwhelm, temporal, somatic, emotional, and cognitive. So during temporal overwhelm, interviewees frequently talked about time stopping. Right in the eye, through the water, can see the eye of the individual, and it was like the world stopped for that moment. We see somatic overwhelm in the common theme of losing one's breath. The blue whale just turned towards us, and then it dove right before it got to the boat, and its fluke came out. The fluke was like as wide as the boat was long, and it took my breath away. I gasped audibly because it's just it's just hard to you just can't fathom something that massive until you've seen a blue whale up close. It sounds a little cliche to use uh, the word but honestly the first one that came to mind is it's just breathtaking probably the most common experience i've seen some somebody have their first time seeing a whale it's just like it literally takes their breath away they gasp they say oh my. Now, regarding emotion, several guides talked about people crying the first time they saw whales in the wild. I've had people literally break down and cry when they've seen the orcas for the very first time. I've met people have told me it was a religious experience for them. So one type of cognitive overwhelm is having one's mind blown. or trying to make sense of the various aspects of the encounters. So this is the last type of overwhelm. Now they're just hanging out because they're curious. They want to know what's going on and what else is curious and lingers around things that are not food or something to mate with. Humans, right? That's how we think. That's our sort of curiosity. So I've presented uh, ideal typical distinctions between different types of overwhelm. But in most of our field notes, we, we found that actually all four types intermingled. So here's an example of that. I am so delighted. Such a warm feeling of contentment rides on top of the excitement. I, I find myself thanking God over and over, both for the wonderful creatures and for my chance to observe them. So all four channels, we are arguing that all four channels uh, have to be overwhelmed to experience awe. For example, curiosity, Better descriptor if you only need to accommodate new information. Surprise? Better descriptor if you only need to account for being somatically overwhelmed. Now I'm going to turn to the focus um, on awe uh, instead of overwhelm. The re reorientation completes the awe experience. Stories of reorientation uh, typically involve including whales within one's understanding of intelligent sentient beings. When you're around the whale, we're in a place like Antarctica, where there's very, very little human impact, you realize how tiny and puny and useless in some ways a human is. Why are my needs and my concerns any more important than that of this whale or that of this frog living in this forest, right? Now, Reorientation generates fresh per, uh, perceptions. This, these new perceptions we suggest stretch and decenter the self process. And what does that feel like to have the self process stretched and decentered? The word that came up over and over again was humbling. I think it's kind of, I guess, say, I'd say mesmerizing and humbling, especially if you know a lot about them. It's very humbling and I love to just watch them. It's like that healthy respect, and I guess it's just really humbling. All right, so becoming a disoriented accounts for feelings of overwhelm and the need to accommodate while providing a more specific reason why these 
reactions are part and parcel of all experiences. If we are motivated to orient, disorientation invites sharp awareness, intense processing to recover orientation. Now, much of the overwhelming sensation of awe results not only from taking in new information, but also from taking in new information that requires established understandings to be accounted for differently. That is to say, such efforts to accommodate create not only immediate cognitive changes, but also spark more intensive and indirect cognitive changes. And as we saw, an example of a perception that would disorient and require reorienting would be finding the unexpected in a place that is foreign to us, an unexpected connection. For example, like a sense of mutual intelligence with a whale in the wild. Caveats. There are a few caveats to our findings that allow us to begin to start specifying scope conditions. For example, although we saw little evidence of awe among adults at SeaWorld, awe was not entirely missing from SeaWorld. We could see excitement and intensity of focus, especially among school-aged children, when the whales did their most important tricks. We know most of the uh, potential of activating awe and the consequences of this awe actually from our interviews, because some of the people who became marine biologists had intense sea world experiences. I saw my first world whale at sea world when I was five years old, and it's the earliest memory that I can trace my, uh, my love of the ocean. Without seeing that first whale, I may never have fallen in love with the ocean, and my life may have been radically different. But that was enough. Something about that entire experience just ignited whatever it was that has carried me up to this point. So how do we understand how children can find awe and experiences that sort of just skim the emotional and experiential surface of adults? Several explanations could account for the difference. First, we observed that children were more likely to engage in active looking. For example, we heard um, a kid the kids were very enthusiastic even before the show started i heard a child shout look mom there's an orca and i was pointing and spotting the whale swimming around behind the stage so that's the first one that they were actively uh searching the way the adults were when the adults were just waiting second children have smaller sets of entertainment experiences so the show rather than resting on familiar tropes could be fresh for the children so third Children engaged in the show in ways that the older people did not. For example, children were called up front, taught gestures to communicate to the whales, and then they signaled to the whales with gestures in initiating the soaking of the entire audience, which they took great delight in. Similarly, not all who experienced whales at sea were moved. I'm sure, especially this is um, you know, this caveat I'm sure is important here is that I'm assuming that many of you have seen whales um, and maybe you didn't have tears streaming down your face on these intense reactions that inspire marine biologists. Uh, many children who brought their phones with them missed the experience altogether. This is a long quote, but I love it, so I gotta, I gotta have it. All right, so almost all of the kids were paying attention to their phones far more than they were looking at the ocean. They're missing the sound of the blowholes due to their headphones as well. Kids teased each other by taking each other's phones. Once the voice sounded panicked as the owner cried, I have a text message as if it were an apparent emergency. I turned to go back upstairs and saw a girl take off her jacket and ask two boys who were looking at her, does this look good? To which the boys shook their head, no. They were looking at their phones or each other, not at the water. No wonder they complained of <coughs> boredom. They weren't actually participating in the whale watching. So although children may be primed for awe in some ways with their greater likelihood of encountering fresh experiences, a distraction that prevents them from focusing and the new will undermine their personal experiences of awe. So and ultimately, um, there were another group um, of children that were given a scavenger hunt um, assignment, and they had to collect information from uh, the context that they were um, they're boating through and they also had to collect information from the naturalists and they were not allowed to have their phones. So in these children were engaged throughout the entire trip. Even when we left the whales, the children moved to the bow yelling like they were on a roller coaster as they enjoyed the rough 
ride in the sea spray. Again, this contrasted with the one phone engaged child who was heard saying, that was the most boring experience of my life. I am never doing that again. A statement, <laughs> um, a statement met with a chorus of affirmation among phone focused <laughs> children. So adults also fell into the phone traps, but in a different way, right? Rather than ignoring whales because of their phone activity, their phones mediated, mediated their experience of whales. I want to be careful not to make an anti-technology argument here because boats got people to whales, drones help people find whales. The problem with the technology seems to be very screen specific. So many people viewed the whale through the lens of their phone or camera. I thought, how can you put technology between you and this creature that is so mysterious and so close? I heard one of the passengers say, I can't tell you how many pictures I've taken of whales. I always think they're going to be great, but when I get home, it's just mostly, I'm just mostly see water. So while there are likely numerous conditions that could give rise to overwhelm sufficient to recenter, we'll illustrate how a combination of the familiar like characteristics of whales embedded in their deeply unfamiliar environment supports an experience of awe. SeaWorld offers the exact opposite, right? The, the, it, it provides the exotic embedded in the familiar, a combination that lends itself to entertainment. So to summarize the awe part, disorientation focuses attention and reinforces active reorienting around new perspectives. Although we are saying that all lends itself to decentering, we are not suggesting that persistent and habitual decentering typically follow from experiences with these animals, right? Again, that wouldn't ring true probably to normal people in this room. Rather, we are suggesting these interactions only provide opportunities for awe in these following uh, experiences that are, we're going to talk, I'm going to talk about now. Enjoy. All right. In some cases, we do indeed see actors actively cultivating a particular disorientation and reorientation, a rhythm back and forth between actively seeking disorientation and uh, reorientation. And we have called this rhythm fascination. So we argue that these researchers keep their work energized by generating increasingly fine tuned calibration to whales. This is to say that the whale research and education allows both orienting and exploring a hybrid experience where uh, expectations enable researchers to engage in finer tune orienting and explore an exploration that affords pleasures of, of ever more nuanced discoveries. So fascination is about training one's attention. This is similar to uh, like wine connoisseurs uh, developing their palate. Right? Maslow stresses the kind of knowledge accrued during these experiences does not make four apples visible where there were only three before, nor do the apples change into bananas. No, it's more a shift in attention than the organization of perception and noticing or realizing that occurs. So we do something very similar to what he describes, but on autopilot in our day-to-day -day lives. During these times, the focus is on the congruence between expectations and past experiences. In fascination, the focus is on the future rather than the past and that which doesn't fit, the unanticipated. So Maslow, again, suggests a particular attitude that encourages this sort of focus on the future and the unknown. He describes it as a healthy openness to the mysterious, the realistically humble recognition that we do not know much, the modest and grateful acceptance of gratuitous grace and a sense of just plain good luck. So a fascination perspective is focused on what one doesn't know and it helps to nurture openness and curiosity. So something this is probably most of us can relate to in the room is researchers, right? This is probably true for, for research more generally. Every time is exciting and I think another part of it that's so great is that you never know what you're going to see or when you'll see it. So I think that surprise aspect also makes everything, uh, every experience different and exciting. So whale researchers who grow ever more fascinated, like the wine connoisseurs, they 
illustrate how freshness in, um, is a perspective that you bring to something. It's not something that's actually there in the environment. Research and teaching hinge on generating fascination and perpetual in the perpetually fresh. Now, teaching allows one to see through fresh eyes over and over again. And these quotes are from a researcher and a naturalist. My enthusiasm is the same throughout. It doesn't deplete just because I've seen them more than anybody else. I am always just as excited as everybody else who sees them for the first time. It's like I'm seeing them for the first time every time. I'm sure, we all feel like that when we teach paper. <laughs> <laughs> Let's say I've worked four days straight, three day, three day trips a day. Maybe the weather has been rough. People are vomiting, not loving the moment, right? And then we see this beautiful mammal. I do not get tired of it. Another interesting thing is that uh, most of these people were talking about humpbacks. And there is, uh, and the word beauty comes up all the time. And I think it objectively, humpbacks are, or maybe not don't fit the categories we would normally associate with beauty, but there is something about them, and I think it's probably in the, in the movement rather than in like literally what they look like. But I think it's fascinating that they're, that that's the one descriptor that comes up over and over again is beauty. Again, caveats. Uh, exposure to similar stimuli does not always lead to fascination. Now, Maslow again explains that familiarization dulls cognition, so people can walk through miraculous happenings without noticing. Familiarization in a word uh, makes it unnecessary to attend, to think, to feel, to live fully, to experience richly. So in the cases I've outlined, fine-tuned fascination leads to an ever-increasing nuanced understanding of whales. As I noted, the whale researchers and educators who, sh who sharpen grow ever more fascinated um, over a lifetime. This was not the case for everyone. Indeed, the galley workers on the whale ships um, could not have been less interested in the whales. People, pos the people positioned so that they could not directly train their attention on the whales paid little attention, even when the whales were breaching and feeding right next to the boat. The gallery workers' bodies were turned away from the whales. One even sat reading a book. This is the whale watcher presented with a breaching, thus the whale, the whale watcher presented with a breaching humpback for the first time can be jarred into experience of profound awe, whereas the cafe worker doesn't even feel the same energy from the, the third breach this week. So if one is working in the snack bar, one does not have the opportunity to fine tune attention as one cannot see the whales particularly well. This is precisely the sort of situation we would imagine that would lead to habituation and desensitization. Now, compare this with a microbiology professor. She introduced herself to me and she explained that she went on whale watches as frequently as she possibly could each summer, which meant going tens of times a year. While explaining her enduring whale watching habit, she suddenly cut off our conversation as we heard that whales were in view. She ran up to one of the guides who knew her and said, who do we have today? Suggesting that she knew the whales by name. So in this talk, this work with Joey, is, I, I, um, I've touched on five areas. Um, the self as a process, the sociology of emotions, authenticity and experience, agency and social change in positive uh, sociology and very briefly going to sum up each of those so the self is a process. Some nearly universal conditions of physical and social maintenance make centering at least intermittently around the physical person. Um, usual. Now, using the abductive approach, we started with existing theory, suggesting the self can become be centered and thereby less self focused. And we identified the somatic, temporal, cognitive, and emotional experiences that generate and sustain these mentoring. So sociology of emotions. The sociology of emotions uh, to this point has left awe and fascination fairly unexplored. Uh, we demonstrate how they can be 
critical in supporting change-oriented action for the greater good. Specifically, we argue that awe is based on disorienting uh, followed by reorienting, and, it's, and that this increases responsibility while shrinking one's sense of self. Fascination is similar to awe, but rather than a jarring sense of being pulled out of one's history, fascination builds history around the unknown and reaffirms the center, a line of inquiry over time. We've also detailed that there are no guarantees for awe and fascination. Indeed, we've demonstrated that we can count on distraction to undermine our capacity for both. Authenticity. Our work here suggests that the concept of authenticity, which has been gar which has garnered a fair amount of attention as an explanation, is not particularly helpful when understanding the unfolding of microsociological dynamics of awe. We do not have an internal barometer for whether something is manufactured or commercialized. Instead, we have a barometer for whether we can metabolize new experiences into the old, if we have to reshape our mental categories to make sense of new information. The challenge of needing to accommodate a, um, in order to better predict, this is a better indicator of awe than a, a vague notion of authenticity. So social change, which is what I started out with and my real passion here to try to understand social change. And like I said, over the long haul. Um, in our case, we've taken up a specific question. How do people become invested in and committed to social change efforts for the greater good at a scale beyond their lifetimes? The empirical approach to investigating social change has, we suggest, has advantages over being pulled into purely theoretical realms of agency and constraint of structures, right? It prevents us if we look at it empirically, it prevents us from assuming that actors have perpetual access to will and are perpetually agents of change. It also keeps us from assuming that agency and constraint are endlessly embedded in each other, training our focus on this mutual in reinforcement over time and, the, and therefore the persistence of uh, structure over time. So indeed, rather than arguing for creative capacity of work and strength, we use our approach to ask the more practical question. What are the conditions that we can associate with that support people in generating pro-social orientations and efforts? We suggest that there are moments when actors can deploy this potential more effectively, such as when actors commence and persist in change-oriented efforts. Understanding possible paths to sustain change offers a way to think about the relationship between actors and their capacity to shape their own context. So basically what we're saying is, um, let's move the agency uh, discussion into the empirical and look at when institutions and structures grow thinner and uh, selves become more powerful and in those moments have a greater opportunity of um, creating change in their environment. Finally, this work exemplifies positive sociology, the sociology of what works. So I have told the story of emotional dynamics that open up perceptions that support working for long term change through comparatively slow and methodical processes, research and education. This story has two sub stories, one about awe, a sharp, sudden emotion that rarely persists, and one about fascination, an emotion that is active, that is more actively cultivated and holds the potential for lifelong durability. So in conclusion, I'll end by pointing out questions rather than making strong claims. How and why do some people explore and others seek the habitual? After accommodating, one can habituate, forget, develop fine-tuned curiosity about the phenomenon. These are all potentially likely outcomes. What tends to generate these different outcomes? So while our research it points to these as important questions, we only begin to answer them. So, okay. Uh, with that, I hope that um, you will consider an empirical approach to social change and uh, and also consider the great importance of research and education for creating uh, social change. Um, so with that, um, I thank you for your time and attention. I'm happy to take your questions. <laughs> um, so thank you so much. That was incredible. Um, so in, the, in neuroscience and cognitive and affective neuroscience, they identified 
three very distinct phases of motivation, right? The anticipatory stage where we're seeking an object or thinking about it, consumptive stage where we're actually manipulating the object, and then the satiation where we're updating or reinforcing or changing what we know or anticipate in the future. And in some ways, what it sounds like is the whale watchers sort of, and maybe I'm wrong, you know, that's kind of what my question is, have skipped the consumption and they've sort of linked the anticipation to the learning in some sort of cycle, or maybe there's like an act, like a cycling between anticipation and consumption and then learning is constantly happening. Whereas in SeaWorld, it sounds like there's very little anticipation and learning and it's more like passive consumption. Does that make sense? Yeah, is that, that is fascinating. I love that interpretation of it. Yeah, um, I love that the, the skipping the consumption, um, that something about uh, the intensity sort of knocks them into the next stage. Uh, and absolutely, um, uh, yeah, I mean, when you just sit there, one of the one of the things that didn't make it into the talk was talking about um, how we could tell whether there was anticipation going on or whether there was waiting, um, which I think also is, you know, uh, relevant to your question. And so we looked a lot at body language and then looked at sort of the, um, you know, the emotional um, events that followed, uh, either the slack waiting or the eager anticipation. And um, yeah, and we also found that um, there seems to be something about the sensory deprivation of active scanning for whales when there's nothing for like a long time that maybe that might be part of too the intensity that knocks them past the consumption stage but yeah there, there seems to be a relationship between almost physical exhaustion from looking and then finding Um, th thank you very much. I, I've um, been thinking about this a little bit in terms of how we might think of whales, uh, and I, I have a few sort of plot comments. Uh, and feel free to choose whatever you want to address. I'm going to tag along for dinner so you can have the thing that you want to talk about. Um, one, one of my one of my sort of thoughts on this was coming from the environmental sociology literature, which kind of is one approach that distinguishes basically between uh, anthropocentrism and kind of bio biocentrism. Those things. Uh, there's different views on this. One is kind of the, the whole nap hap distinction that Riley Dunlap developed. I don't know if you're familiar with that, but he, he would argue something like you know people who are kind of on the biocentric part of this continuum have a very different experience than people who would be on the anthropocentric side, and, and in particular the one person that you mentioned, you know, what, what, how does this affect me or why should I care or whatever would be kind of a very anthropocentric view. Uh, so so anyways, one thought I, I had was, you know, like the extent to which what you're doing kind of, kind of hooks up with that. Uh, another thought that I had was, um, to a certain extent, this is a very, this is historically contingent because the way that we think about whales has changed very much. A uh, hundred years ago, whales were just totally thought of as real horses. So they were nothing else. Um, and even as recently as about the 1960s, they were just seen as pretty much, or at least things like orcas were seen as pretty much the same as great white whales. They, we had a totally different view even back in the 1960s. Uh, so, so anyway, that, that's kind of another thought is it's kind of part of historically contingent. Um, the other part is, you know, so, so I, you're kind of capturing this by comparing the whale watching with, with SeaWorld, but it is contingent on people's relationship to the, to the whales. And I was thinking about this in a couple of different ways. One is, you know, what about whale hunters? Uh, they might have a different view on things. And even though most of us would find whale hunting pretty repugnant, uh, some people actually make the argument that, that people who are hunters actually often have greater appreciation uh, for the thing they're hunting than the average person who's not really very engaged in that. Mm -hmm. um, and kind of pushing that a little bit further, there are some indigenous peoples who practice traditional whale hunting, right? And, and so they might actually have this kind of combination of awe, but other, other thoughts about the process. So, those are a few kind of random thoughts on these things. Thank you. 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 Thank
But this is what, exactly what I was hoping to get, you know, that, um, you know, uh, coming to a place where people do environmental sociology and culture um, and social movements. I was like, this is perfect. <laughs> so I'm, I'm, I'm going to take everything you said, because I am new to environmental sociology. The introduction said this, that's not, it has my home field. So I'm, um, you gave me a lot to think about. Another thing that um, it's historically contingent, uh, yeah, clearly. It's also the, um, as I've, I've talked with some of the people that I um, talked with before the talk, that, um, you know, I, we're also struggling to make sense of um, class and um, race, and because we're capturing mostly white people, the whale watching surprising number of where we were, uh, we were in uh, Providence, Rhode Island, and um, every boat seemed to be majority, majority European. So not only was it white, it was, it was more specific um, than that. And it's extremely expensive to go to SeaWorld and to go whale watching. My one thought that may help the class angle but probably won't help the race angle at all, is um, I met somebody who was, uh, was a fisher person. I'm not really sure how to say it. Like, I used to fly, you can say fly angling, but I don't know how you capture. Fisher. Fisher, okay, they're fisher. I met a fisher um, at one of the whale watches who brought his significant other because he wanted that significant other to know what it was like for him to have these really frequent encounters with whales. And that was sparked, I was like, oh, that's a completely different set of people. Um, uh, so yes, they're the people who hunt the whales, but then they're the people who hunt the, the fish that the whales eat too, who encounter them frequently, right? And um, so that might be a way of getting around some of the, uh, those issues too, but um, I'm definitely gonna impress you for more over there. Yes. Um, thank you, that was really interesting. Uh, there's lots to think of. I have to be honest, as I was listening to your talk, I kept thinking about a joke we have about our cats and how the, their name for me is food. Right? Like, like that there's something that they love me. Like, I'm like, oh, they love me, but they're just like, Shh, And so, you know, maybe this is in some ways a response to what Dave said as well, which is I was struck by, there's like a, there is like an anthropocentric quality to all of these accounts, right? Where people are, like the idea that the whale is living in your soul, right? Like, I found that like profoundly anthrop anthropomorph or, you know, anthropomorphizing yeah. or um, androcentric or however you want to think about it. Um, and so I guess that, I guess one question that raises, raises is what is actually happening here, right? If this, if like this incredibly human construction that in a way still seemed really I wasn't entirely convinced that it was decentering, that it was itself was still really central. Um, related to that, I'm, I'm curious about, like I was struck by the quote where somebody says, like, this will sound cliche, or the person who's like, it was humbling, it was a humbling experience. All I can say is it was humbling, like people were sort of <laughs> struggling with the ability to articulate these experiences, and I, I found myself wondering if, um, if part of what you're discovering is like the models we have for talking about powerful experiences, right? Like if that's partly when people are recounting these, that's partly what they're doing is reproducing. Because I was thinking like, of course, it takes your breath away, right? It's like, it's, it, it sounds cliche, but it's like, if these are the, these are the frames that are available for us to talk about these experiences. So, um, so maybe I'll stop there. The first question is like, is this actually just a kind of profoundly anthropo anthropocentric uh, thing that's going on when we think of this as some kind of genuine um, decentering? Um, and then the other is uh, how to think about these temporal, somatic, emotional, cognitive ways that people experience decentering, or if, if, the, if what they're actually doing is just recounting the cultural models we have for talking powerful I guess yeah to take the, the last part first um, I think so I, I, you may have noticed uh, it was extremely difficult to read the quotes the uh, ethnographic notes fine but I think people were having a rare time articulating and that's why they were you know, stopping starting stopping starting um, and it makes it very difficult to read but so I think that that is um, definitely gives support 
you know, your your um, approach that you know that this is they're coming up against the limits of experience. In terms of like whether they're actually being decentered or not, that's a really interesting question because there is like the objectively, are they objectively taking the whale in? But then there's also the phenomenology of it, which is they experience themselves taking the whale in, right? And so I think from a phenomenological perspective, like their personal experiences, they are they're including information from a source that isn't directly tied to their history. Um, so I think in that way they are, but I think it's probably really important to put that fine point on it though, about um, two things. Technically, are they actually expanding or are they just like, like mapping it onto their personal experience? Um, and what was the other one I was gonna say? Um, I totally cannot remember. <laughs> <laughs> it will come to me when I'm when, uh, uh, at least expected. <laughs> In the middle of the night, oh my god. <laughs> yes. Thank you very much for your talk. Um, I'm thinking of the, the, the conditions under which uh, all of the fascination emerge, and wondering if in some cases it's less experiential and, and more about uh, dis disposition and so an affective disposition. So I think about uh, Michael Rodolo's recent article about the fight or flight for America, sort of affective systems of Christian nationalists and one sort of rage or fear disposition. And I'm wondering if people who go whale watching or go to Sea World maybe may have certain affective dispositions or affective uh, neural systems that make them more or less disposed or likely to experience law of first fascination and it's less about the actual experience. That's really interesting. I'm wondering how um my inclination is to say that that's something I at least have to be able to account for um because I think it, it could be a, a factor and I'm trying to imagine how to account for that though um if you have ideas please share them <laughs> <laughs> yes I only have a quick um Amy's question or comment about interest or what does Amy think of um, this author, Simon Emery, who's quite right now, who works with octopuses. And she has this quote that I thought was really great that said, There's something so anthropocentric about thinking that animals would lack a soul. And mm -hmm. that actually is the most profound anthropocentrism, is to think that that's all the human characteristic. Mm -hmm. That's interesting. So, um, yeah, I mean, that sounds like there's an entire paper that could be written about sort of. Uh, the notion of animal souls and when we um, objectively, what are we experiencing when we look in the eye and see something reflected back at us? Because clearly we don't get, we, I mean, it, I did have an experience on a whale watch where a whale, probably about as far away from me as the first table, the humpback came up and just stayed up and just looked at me in the eye. And I was like, it was really weird because there was there were only like two other people on that side of the boat who shared the experience, and then when it went, we just looked at each other and we're like, we couldn't even say anything. It was unbelievable, and you know, it could be just raw size, it could be a lot of things, but you know, I got a sense of intelligence that I would get from my dog. You know, I think my dog is actually a really smart dog, a special dog. <laughs> <laughs> um, so I do think that there's something there. So maybe it's like really at the intersection between you know the phenomenology, just looking at the experience of it, and objectively what's going on, um, you know, in terms of the brain science and in terms of what is actually going on in the brains of the animals too, because we know increasingly more about that. The other thing I was thinking offhand, um, I so I one summer lived in North Tokyo, which is where a lot of people from Europe come from you know, watching. <laughs> and one of the perks of working in the service industry in Tokyo is you got to go on standby on any trips. So I think there was like room in the boat, I would go. And so I went whale watching like 15 times. Um, and one of the things that I wondered, and then I did go whale watching with my family when they came to visit and paid for it. And I'm wondering about the, the impact of money. Partly I was thinking about it with like kids versus adults. Like the kids haven't paid for it, so they're like, oh yeah. man. But I do think that there was maybe there's this like anticipation.
education that also comes with having a capital investment in it? And I was just wondering if that came up at all. Yeah, it came up. It came up a lot in that um, the first summer I was doing this, uh, there were almost no, there were just, the whales did not come to the, the bay around Cape Cod, there just weren't whales. And so a lot of trips are going out and coming back without seeing anything. So that is interesting. And there was recently, and I'm not gonna get the name right, um, uh, of ethnography that came out about um, how uh, guides uh, manage the experiences of whale watchers. Um, but there was a lot of work that was done to prepare people for, in this case, not seeing whales. Um, so, um, yeah, yeah, I guess that's, <laughs> yes. Oh, just further to that, um, um, so my, my work, we're going to Costa Rica next week. Um, for <laughs> and uh, you know, we're preparing ourselves for awe, right? Like we're we're going to see yeah. tans, we're going to see monkeys, we're going to go into the jungle. Yeah. Um, there's this kind of class-based anticipatory preparing for the experience of awe yeah. um, that strikes me. And so I wonder, like, how much awe? Is there a real? Yeah. There's, there's so much that goes into the well watching trip um, in this regard. Um, how much real are? And I would imagine in some cases it will anticip anticipating will um, could ruin it. In other cases, it will make it. Right, and I'm really curious about under what conditions. You know, being prepared to be totally odd. Um, you're like, that's it, you know, and or the people that, you know, um, are crying, uh, you know, and, or I have a, a quote about a woman who like laughed crying when she saw sea turtles. And I didn't include it because it was about sea turtles instead of whales, but um, she was having that reaction because she, she knew that um, yeah, and marine biology had played a role in bringing them back to a certain extent, right? And so this was this really powerful moment. So that's, that's clearly culturally informed, right? That it's only when you have that knowledge does that become like a super heightened kind of thing. So yeah, I guess this to say, uh, yeah, there's definitely a culture element mediating this, and um, I think it's a good, good question. And I think if you go either way, I hope that you have all though. <laughs> I do as well. Yeah, I just want to follow up on both Emily and Jerry's point about the, the money and the anticipated all. It makes me think of when you go on BC ferries, which you're going over to Victoria anyways, and then if the captain of the ship says, there are, there's four whales on the starboard side, I never even know what that is, and literally the whole boat feels like it, like everyone runs over, and it's like the ferry's like this, and it's very exciting, and I feel like I've been on that ferry, whatever, 500 times, I don't know how many times, hundreds of times, and I would still run every time to see the whales, and I feel like everyone would, and you haven't paid for them, and you haven't anticipated it, and it still has the same purpose, I don't know if it's the same, I don't think people are crying, but everyone's over there, right, even if you've been on the ferry a hundred times, so I just wonder, I, I feel like that's kind of an interesting comparison, the sort of the surprise awe moment as opposed to the one that you really emotionally pumped yourself up for. Like the two men you see just walking down the street. Yeah. I need to include uh, the fishers and the fairies. <laughs> Clearly, yeah, no, because those are very different contexts from what I've captured. And they're definitely, you know, in the situations where they both see at least as many whales, right? So, yes. We have a question from the chat. Uh, you know, if you're willing to unmute, let me make sure that I've got my volume up too. Great. Is it is it working? Uh, just a sec. I just need to switch my speaker. Uh, it's currently defaulting to the camera, which is not ideal. All right. Uh, try now. Okay. Is it working? Yes. Great. Thanks so much for this. I really enjoyed it, even though it was mediated by a screen, and and that seems to diminish it somehow. Um, but I, I had a curious. I was really curious about the sort of people who weren't drawn into awe, and how so many of them were presumably focused on others in a way, right? So parents focused on their children, teens focused on each other. 
I'm wondering whether or not that gets at something interesting here in terms of you need to start self-centered and then be shifted off that self-centeredness if that's part of what creates the conditions of awe. So, so you need to actually start with the self-centering and not everybody can do that. Parents can't do that when they've got kids at SeaWorld, right? I mean, like, like so, so is that part of the process? And I'm so fascinated by your use of process here and understanding these concepts. Is that sort of part of the process that generates that awe? So the needing to start with the self-centering, it, 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 what it reminds me of are some of the really intense activists I studied and about how if they, I think you could definitely say that they had um, decentered selves and, and that they gave their entire lives to um, people, groups of people that, um, you know, that they, they only knew through activism and, um, and how many of them would burn out. Um, uh, and suffer and sometimes terrible trauma that was self-induced because they didn't take like moments to come back and actually inhabit themselves. So this does suggest, I mean, you're bringing that up. So uh, you're bringing up my uh, memory of that. Um, and so it does suggest that, it's, that, you know, maybe the capacity to decenter, um, you know, uh, you, like you said, you might need to start self-centered or whatever, but but I think it's also important to consider that it may not always be um, the best thing in every condition over the long term, right? That it's it seems to be important for being able to work up genuine empathy and compassion, but it's probably wrong to assume that it is always um, uh, healthy or useful. Yes. Does that talk back to your original thinking of self as a social process? So that the decentering and centering is a thing that you do and put your own through. But it's not staying next to the old girls' group, but that one has to reflect in the back of the decentering and decentering and recentering. So that means this thing that goes through these different things, we have to get a sense of that through. Yeah, I mean, I think that that's what we're, we're I think we're getting at uh, very much what you're talking about with trying to talk about the um, um, the motivation to explore and experience uh, excitement and emotion, but that that's always followed with the need to like metabolize the experience, make sense of it. And so, so yeah, like you said, definitely a rhythm and the back and forth kind of thing, absolutely. Yes. Erica, thank you so much. My quick question was about something you said at the end. And I want to confirm that I heard you correctly before I ask a question about it, because if I heard it incorrectly, then it's useless. Um, but at the end, I think you said that you, you made the statement that authenticity was not super important to the micro sociological processes of all and fascination, right? Yes. Okay. <laughs> I, so yeah, I guess I wanted was hoping you could maybe expand upon that, because that struck me as really provocative and um, I guess I wasn't like in this idea of studying naturalists who work at whale watching companies and also at SeaWorld. Like, I, it seems like there's something inauthentic about engaging with the natural environment at SeaWorld versus when you're out in the wild. And maybe this gets at some of this idea of like what you expect or the anticipatory or like the unexpected in developing notions of authenticity. So yeah, I wondered if you could remind me some of the evidence about that statement. The authenticity, I, I do statement. think that there, um, uh, uh, please don't get me wrong in that, like, I think that definitely there are more authentic experiences right. of whales, but I think that when people are decentering, that especially when you can see, see that what happened to the children at SeaWorld and how that was effective, mm -hmm. it's just that for the very micro dynamics I'm looking at, that's not the strongest explanation. Mm -hmm. That. Um, but um, absolutely, um, you know, I mean, it's, you only have to go on one whale watch to see how inauthentic, you know, in terms of if nature is authentic, right. sea world is. And so the provocative, what I was trying to do is be provocative about like the very micro dynamics of what shaping personal experience during those moments. Gotcha. Okay. Thank you. Yeah. Thanks. So I was wondering if you would be a third maybe a third point of comparison with uh, indigenous folks or other that would treat whales as key members, right? Mm -hmm. And so that would be a different kind of comparison with these maybe bi marine biologists and maybe our traditions or not. Uh, in the sense that maybe there's not this sensory or recentering, but more an expansion. So, like, welcoming melders, right? 
you knew if you have them yeah, there is, I think that the notion of self-expansion, um, there is work done by Aaron and Aaron um, that uh, they've been doing the work for, I think, almost 30 years now, where they talk about uh, the health of expanding the self and how the self expands. Um, and yeah, that essentially the expanded self or the self that can become routinely expanded, if not perpetually expanded, is a healthy self. Um, and that there are different cultures are better at supporting that expansion than others. Um, and it's interesting because they also, um, they're psychologists and I believe one of them is also a therapist. So sometimes they give very, very like practical advice. So they're like, you know, if you've already expanded it into your spouse as far as you possibly can, you already know everything about them, you already had that like excitement of expanding into somebody else. What you need to do is like jump out of planes together. <laughs> you know that you need to, you need to like expand the self with them too, and like through excitement or whatever or or whatever. But but very much. But their point, though, I mean, it's sort of a silly example. But their point is that it is it's healthy to have the health the self expand, and that definitely um, certain cultures um, inhibit that with the emphasis on the personal embodied self. Yeah, but I was wondering about the key. If you, if you can see the whales not as something else, that you need to be centered and recenter because of the fall, but it's your member of your community, right? Right, yeah. How different that would be? Yeah, I have to imagine that that is a fun. All right, so I definitely need to do that, and I need to do the fairies. I need to do the fairies. <laughs> um, but no, you're right. That's going to be. I wonder if it would have anything at all to do with what I said today. I mean, I think that it would be so very radically different. But the comparison would have to be rich, I would think. Um, I just wanted to kind of go back to, I and mean, there's an interesting conversation that's sort of like brewing about, like, like whether pain or like you know the sort of class-based disposition of like anticipating seeing two cats, for instance, right? Like, there's something, like, there's sort of this this sense that we should have this unmediated, raw, pure sense of awe. And you know, I keep thinking going back to Becker's article on becoming a marijuana smoker, where you know anyone who imbibes you know alcohol or drugs, they're going to feel something, right? But there's also there's this learning process that requires identifying what that is, tying all these things together. It's a social process. So you know, you're talking about the whale watchers, like going through an interaction ritual, right, where they're like all running and going like, oh my god, there it is, and then like talking about it afterwards, and for like a child who has no context whatsoever, I imagine being on a boat staring at this like empty sea where most of their life is contained in buildings of school. Sea world makes more sense. It's, it's like overstimulation. They're told by their parents they're gonna see a whale, it's gonna jump up and do some stuff, you know, and um, so it just seems to me like there's a there is this constructive part. It is required. Awe is in a, a name that we give to them, a feeling that we get. And there's probably an opportunity, you know, I know there's research on chimpanzees and we find that they often will be sitting, staring at waterfalls and there's a belief that there's some kind of like sense of awe if we were to use a human emotion to it. But I think that that's kind of a piece here, right? That there's the learning, there's the, this part about anticipation, like skipping the consumption to the learning and people getting into these like sort of feedback loops and that's what they desire. Crossword puzzle people are like this as well. And, Thrill seekers are like this as well, and you know, I, I mean, yeah, I don't, I don't have a question, but I kind of feel like it's not as problematic. Like I feel like awe is always mediated socially, right? It's always built on, you know, what we think is going to happen and what we've been told and all the Reddit that we read and everything. But what's interesting is the phenomenology of it is that it isn't mediated, right? So that's an interesting combination, right? Mm -hmm. Just like any experience is going to be mediated, but we feel like it's less mediated, so right. it's. That's um, it's very interesting to me. I just um, I also realized that I didn't go to the last slide. <laughs> <laughs> yes. We have time for one more. Sorry, yeah. I think it was a question. Um, yeah, and uh, this might be a very naive question, but I uh, think uh, from the phenomenological perspective, was there is a construction of the meaning would it be? Before we we see it's like this some sensitivities, okay. So say, uh, because if we look at the um, um, zero work 
So um, I guess the, the presence presence is very important because presence will give will be like the anchoring point, uh, which will uh, provide the meaning of the past and the future. So I'm not sure say whether we uh, need to focus on the instruction of the meaning first. Yeah, and another thing is like I I'm sure that you are aware of this. It's like in human geography, they also talk about this like like if you find the work like about the all and also self and things like that, and they talk about it's like uh, pretty much it's, this is from a place making process. You are changing a space and there with all these things and the interactions and the people, you are changing the space to a place. And then uh, the wall will reveal itself to you. But I think it's like a fun more uh, phen uh, phen uh, phenomenological perspective or symbolic uh, interactionist uh, perspective. People want to pay more attention to uh, situations or interactions or scenarios. But they would argue that that's about the place. So, how to reconcile these different types of debates or lines of reasoning? Okay, I guess it's a pretty naive question. We could continue. No, no, it's not a naive question at all. It's really important. Um, place versus situations. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah, that's. I think I will reveal my training, which is that you know situations are the fundamental unit that like I go into the world assuming, mm -hmm. and you're you're right. That's like that's an assumption, that, and I'm sure it's reflected throughout the the entire project. It would be very interesting. To, to make the flip that you suggest and, and see what I get going back to the data, that would be really interesting. Um, yeah, I'm not sure what else to say uh, beyond that, but... Um, yeah, how about the meaning, the construction of the meaning? Yeah, the construction of the meaning versus yeah. the place? No, the construction of the meaning in terms, I guess, more like a more, like a more general question about the say the perpetuation of the social structure or or, the, or for social change. So do we need that part of in front? Uh, even if we talk about the all and things like that. Alright, so let me see if I'm understanding you correctly. So you are you suggesting that looking at whether meaning comes before or after? Uh, before. Before. Before, right. Right, so looking at how sort of expectations. Right, right, right. Shape the experience. Yeah. Yeah, um, um, yeah I think that that is undoubtedly, it's undoubtedly relevant. Um, I think it points to probably some of the limitations with our methods in terms of being able to talk to people before and after whale watches and so we can talk about what they're bringing with them a little bit more because what we had access to is just sort of the moment right but i'll give you uh, um, an answer that suggests that you're right in pointing to how important that is which is that um you know people experience awe when you could just as easily experience terror right i mean these are they're huge and scary um, and they, but that's not how they respond, right? So in order to take something in a place that is foreign, in a creature that is huge and looks dangerous, and to experience awe instead of terror, there has to be a huge amount of meaning work actually going on before him, right? Yeah. That's yeah. All right, thank you so much. For that. I'm Katherine Corgo Brown, the head of sociology at UBC. Thanks for watching our video. To learn more about UBC sociology, please subscribe.